Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Grain. Uh, welcome to our podcast. Gosh, Matt, I'm not sure what we're number up to yet, but we 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 are we've got several of these kind of in the can. Uh, we these are both uh, shared uh, joint ventures between Conversations on Retail and the University of Arkansas and the Sam Walton College. And uh, my name is Mike Grain. I'm going to be uh, kind of hosting this particular uh, podcast today. It's all about retail shelf, uh, retail on shelf availability, uh, and I've spent uh, twenty five years, twenty five years with P and G, about ten with Walmart. Uh, Ken Drish and I spent some time at Crossmark together, and now uh, I'm working on all things on shelf availability. So we'll uh, we'll introduce those guys here in a little bit. Uh, but really, as background, we we have been trying to host these uh, podcasts to talk about the really the importance of on shelf availability. Um, so we got a couple of companies on here. I told you uh, a few weeks ago we were going to have field agent and tracks on, but let me give you a little bit of context about sort of how they fit with the on-shelf availability uh, platform. I know you've seen this before, but I think it's important to, to kind of show it. But uh, we do have some suppliers that we've seen before with like Retail Insights and uh, companies like Team Core that have algorithms, and those algorithms are pretty useful for high-velocity kinds of things to be able to say when you have an on-shelf availability issue. There's also store audits, which is obviously the topic of conversation today. We've got people who uh, are actually going into stores, collecting in-store conditions, and then today's podcast is all about those. But uh, but I wanna make sure that you understand the context, but this works really, really well for uh, different tests you're doing, uh, different samples, things you're trying to do. It especially works very, very well, I think, with lower velocity items that don't have a tremendous amount of movement and are very difficult to work with an algorithm. We've also seen uh, examples of shelf scanning, scanning robots. Um, I know we had a panel on with the Brain Corporation, Zippity, uh, Simbi, and Badger Robotics, and we walked through kind of the op opportunities at shelf scanning robots. And then I know we've had some, uh, some time with uh, the folks uh, on the RFID side as well. There's two that we may get into. Well, this one for sure we may get into. These are uh, what I will call uh, online shoppers. So this is a, this is an example of Instacart, where you literally have a customer that's shopping on behalf of a uh, of a consumer, if you will. And anything that's an on shelf availability issue potentially could get could get captured and feed an on shelf availability algorithm. And then last week, uh, last month we had. Uh, fixed cameras in store with focal systems and SES, et cetera. So these are a lot of different tools and a lot of different capabilities. Um, and, and today we really want to focus on just the on-shelf availability as it relates to in-store conditions. So I want to introduce my good friend, uh, Henry Ho. Henry, I think you and I have known each other for probably close to 30 years, I think. Uh, we both uh, kind of began our careers at Procter & Gamble together, and uh, he, being the entrepreneur he is, set out a vision for, you know, trying to do some things entrepreneurial as it relates to Walmart and the supplier. So uh, he is the co-founder of a company called Field Agent. So, Henry, I'm going to have you have you on mute and uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Field Agent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's good to be here. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, yeah, my name is Henry Ho, and... Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Field Agent. I'm the chief strategy officer. Uh, Field Agent has been around uh, since uh, 2011, uh, actually 2010. Um, and uh, we uh, crowdsource uh, consumers, everyday shoppers uh, to go into stores and help us do three main things. Uh, audits, provide insights to shopping environment, and then lastly, uh, provide trial mechanisms for brands. You know, the, th the, the five things I would say that are interesting for people uh, uh, listening into this uh, podcast is the, that we've democratized access to uh, OSA audits. Uh, really, anyone, regardless of size, if you're a small vendor, a medium-sized vendor, large vendor, 
uh, you have access to field agent and our tools and solutions. Secondly, uh, coverage and scale. We can basically go anywhere, uh, any market uh, in the US, continental uh, US, as well as Hawaii and Alaska, uh, uh, any channel of, of trade and really any retailer. So that that's uh, at any moment, uh, if you have a need to understand what's going on in the shelf, we, we can do that. Speed, really anytime we give you near real-time view of the shelf. Uh, so our clients uh, use us, uh, whether it's, hey, I, I need it to, to see what's going on today or a week from now or two weeks from now, whatever. Um, and then we've worked really hard over the last few years to continue to increase the value of what we do. Uh, we uh, develop pre-built solutions to drive costs down and to increase speed. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then uh, a key distinctive is the quality of the data. We, we QC all of the things that we collect, all the information, and uh, we, we aim to have just an incredible user experience for our users. So, Awesome. Thank you, Henry. Appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate it. Mr. Drish, um, you and I have known each other for a while. It's, the great thing is I've been in this industry long enough, you run into somebody, right? And so that's the nice thing about these podcasts is I get to connect with old friends like Henry and, and Ken, and and uh, we were different times doing different work together, but uh, it all comes back to Trax Company has been around for quite a while, Ken, and uh, you play a very role, uh, important role as the VP of sales for that, for I believe the US market, if that's correct. But tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Trax. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Mike and, and Henry and Matt. Appreciate the time to to be here. I, as Mike mentioned, I've been with Trax Retail now a little over two years. Um, really spent the majority of my career though working for traditional sales and marketing agencies. I, I spent uh, a long amount of time where I met Mike at uh, at Crossmark. I've, I've worked for Acosta, so really kind of consider myself a student of the space and a student of the industry. Trax, um, you know, really is is a company that got its start in 2010 with the vision of um, leveraging computer vision uh, for CPG companies to really kind of digitize the retail shelf and then glean all sorts of insights out of that, share of shelf, planogram compliance, pricing compliance, OSA, et cetera. Uh, it had always been the vision of the company though to have their own feet on the street. So that came about through really two large acquisitions. One in 2018, we acquired a company called Curie, uh, much like Henry's organization was in kind of the, the audit, on-demand audit space, uh, leveraging crowdsource. Uh, but then we also acquired a company in early 2020 called Survey.com based out of Boston, ironically still in, uh, in, in business for about 10 years as well. Uh, Survey um, took it to one incremental level. So um, the ability to audit, but then also be able to react and fix. So what we have today is what we call Traxxas FlexForce, which is an on-demand, flexible uh, group of individuals nationally uh, that can go out and, and not only audit, but also audit and fix and, and do some of the general um, type of merchandising work that would need to be done in stores. Um, the simplest way I like to describe it is, is, is really kind of the Uber Lyft model of in-store execution and merchandising. Awesome, perfect. All right. Well, we've got a few questions that I know we're going to ask you up front, um, but but we'll start out with those just so just the, so the audience knows. We we will. I've, I'm going to ask these questions. I've got three or four of them, and then I'm going to open it up for question and answers from the audience. So, uh, just based upon the the note that uh, Matt just said, if you do have a question at any point in time, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, and we will unmute. If you just want to ask the question via chat, you can do that as well. But first one, we'll just start this off with Henry. Um, business drivers, you talked about a lot of things that this particular do, this technology does. Walk us through the business drivers. Are these retail retailer ass? Are they brand owner ass? Exactly what are you doing? What are the business drivers for shelf audits and retail? Yeah, I think the primary driver, Mike, is um, the, the, the need uh, to see um, and understand what is going on at retail. Visibility to uh, issues, problems, or even opportunities. Uh, um, and so they come from a variety of, of clients, uh, including retailers, um, mainly CPG, um, anybody really doing business at retail. Um, and they, they want to understand either directionally uh, what the, what the 
performance and execution compliance is to a particular program or initiative that they have. Um, as Ken mentioned, uh, and then they want to be able to uh, be able to fix and, and get in and uh, uh, provide a solution a recommendation sometimes, uh, sometimes an analysis of what's going on. So uh, that's the main thing. And as it regards to on-shelf availability, uh, you know, probably the best eye is the human eye, uh, contrary to some, some other folks, because the, you know, the, the computer technologies are, are really good and they're getting better every, every month. Um, but right now, the consumer, the on-shelf shopper availability, uh, there's no better uh, way to tell you what's going on than a shopper. Got it. So, so classic example, I've got, uh, I've got a product, let's say I'm Procter and Gamble and I've got a, a, a group of products in the wet shave category, let's say call it razor blades. And I'm not sure that I'm, I'm selling as many as I would expect it in, let's say a Kroger store or a Walgreens store or CVS or whatever. So what does that look like? And this question is for you too. So what, what does that look like? So do I, I, I believe I have a problem. I don't have the access to all those stores. So what does that look like? What do you guys do? And, and how does that portray back to me from a result standpoint? Is it just a list of all the problems or is it actually getting involved and actually fixing the issues that you guys see at store? Yeah, so I, th I think it really depends. And I, and I love what Henry said about, you know, there's no better way than the human eye of seeing what's going on out there. Um, and he's right. I'm looking at tools like Retail Link and Nielsen and IRI data are all excellent tools, but in many cases, in most cases, they're they're um, backward looking uh, rather than looking at what's really going on at the shelf today. So um, Mike, it really depends. And, and I'm glad you brought up the wet shave category. We had a client um, that we audited um, literally 65,000 stores for uh, because their concern was sales were declining, but they felt that there was a opportunity in some stores that had locked that product up um, versus leaving it out. And obviously there are some locations where you need to do that because they're high theft, but you can't apply a one size fits all. So getting out there and seeing what exactly was happening in the, at store level. And then in their case, we weren't taking corrective action. We were just providing the data back and they were utilizing the data to go back to their merchant and identify, you know, here are, here's a block of stores that we know are high, high theft areas. They need to be locked up. Here are other ones that probably aren't, and you'd probably do better if you had that product available for the reps. Mm, gotcha. Great example. Great example. Uh, any other business drivers that you'd like to add to the list that Henry provided, Ken? Anything else that we're missing? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's so many around OSA, um, especially with the recent supply chain challenges that, that have come mm -hmm. up. And, and they're not all done yet. There's, there, there's still challenges out there. But I think being able to utilize uh, groups like ours, um, like Henry's and, and, and Trax's, really allows you to kind of pinpoint where you know the known issues are and then go and get the real idea of what's really happening out there. And of course, Henry's team can do it um, in, in lightning speed. Ours is a little bit more um, because we're doing more of an audit and fix um, situation. But I, I would say OSA is OSA audits are great to, you know, where you've got an issue that the data, you, you're, you're pretty much stopped at the data. You need to see what's exactly going on out there in the field. But several other audits, um, uh, you know, are, are um, requested of us too. display execution, mm -hmm. planogram compliance, uh, even retailers now asking us for compliance on their own stores, mm. whether or not the marketing materials that are up or, or what should be, et cetera. Yeah, I'm sure it's a sensitive topic, but I've also understood that there are some CPG companies out there that use that to drive and measure compliance of the third party service providers in store. Did you really set everything the way you said you did? I'm sure that's like one of those little things that people want to like talk about. But if I'm paying real live money to a third party to go out and execute work and they say, yeah, I'm getting it all done. But uh, you guys potentially providing an audit service afterwards to say that was or wasn't the case. Yeah, I would I would say that that is without a doubt um, that that is coming up, and also for the handful of CPG companies that still have their own direct teams, mm -hmm. many of them like uh, Coca Cola, Mondelez have developed what they call a perfect store program, mm -hmm. and they utilize our image recognition to 
really verify that it truly is a perfect store rather than just a, an audit. So it's, it's leveraging digital images and insights out of that. And in many cases, they utilize that to measure the performance of their reps and incentivize them. Awesome. Awesome. Adoption seems to be going up. Um, tell us about where you see this kind of going in the future more. Are you just getting the word out of the services that you guys provide or are there other new capabilities that people are starting to, to latch onto that uh, are starting to make sense for store audits? Yeah, I think, Mike, I think um, adoption is, is increasing. Uh, uh, it's never been more important to be on the shelf in stock. Um, and, uh, you know, programs that supply, uh, suppliers are, are, are uh, been exposed to at, at places like Walmart where they may swap you out you know, if, uh, if you're not in stock over a period of time, that, that's, uh, that's the real, there's a real penalty box if you're mm -hmm. not in. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about drivers, there's gaps in the data uh, that people need to understand that not, not, not all algorithms, people are using a lot of algorithm to, algorithms to predict OSA. Um, and uh, in some categories, it makes sense um, to, uh, to use uh, algorithms to, to be predictive. Um, and those tend to be high turn um, categories or items. Um, and for us, we, we do a fair amount of work with people with slower turn items where their, you know, their, their retail link or their POS data does not really give them the insights that they need. Uh, so more and more people are, are using and need uh, these types of services to just get a, a knowledge base of what's going on out there so they can take action or uh, partner with their retailers to go fix the, some of these things. Got it. I, I would agree that adoption is definitely increasing. Um, one thing that I have noticed the trend of is, is uh, people who are seeking these types of services want to be able to truly target where they go. They know where they believe the issues are. And rather than just having a, you know, a blanket, you know, audit of all 4,000 Walmart stores, for example, they want to go to these 1,521 stores. Mm -hmm. And I think organizations that can, can do that and can do that quickly are going to continue to benefit. And that's really going to benefit the, the, the client in this case as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Great example. Hey, Mike, one, one of the things, um, you know, I've been following this series and uh, have been listening to this uh, with, with a great deal of interest. And I think the, the technology that's coming into place uh, is very, very exciting, that whether it's robots on show cameras and, and whatnot. The, the reality is there's business that still need to be able to view uh, the entire channel or, or grocery, and they need to see the picture now. And those technologies are emerging and they're coming along, but it does, anybody who really needs to see their distribution or on-shelf availability across all the grocery drug mass and whatnot, Ken mentioned a big, big project that he had. Uh, there's nobody who can do it with current technology because they're in limited phases of pilots. Our mm -hmm. solutions are solutions that are now, um, and we can get out to any channel, any, right? Any market, any retailer. And right. so we have a major client uh, that are not looking for acute uh, or necessarily acute problems, but they want a steady beat and flow uh, of what's going on in the shelves week in and week out. Mm -hmm. And so we have major programs uh, with, with clients where we're giving them visibility uh, across all of retail uh, to, to understand what's going on, um, and it gives them the holistic view of the business, maybe not just at Walmart or, or uh, in the drug channel or whatever it may be. So mm. the, our tools are now here and now, and they're effective and they're uh, of high quality. So, yeah. Well, and you met, and you mentioned other technologies. We've clearly sp spoken to the folks who run the algorithms and with algorithms, you said exactly right hand with high velocity things that are selling eight to 10 to 12 a day. If I'm selling eight and then 10, then 12, then 15, then zero, 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 I, I have a pretty good idea of the product went on the shelf. That's hard to do with 
a toothbrush. <laughs> it's hard to do with a cosmetic. It's hard to do with a razor blade because you may only sell one or two a month. Is it not on the shelf or is it just not selling enough to make a blip, right? And so to me, that's where you guys come in. I think the question becomes, there are other tools in the tool bag that could be used by, especially for the retailer. We've talked about shelf scanning robots. We've talked about fixed cameras uh, in the apparel and general merchandise, kind of the RFID, et cetera. So I think what you just did was say exactly why that's a benefit. A, it's in the CPG supplier's control. Those other decisions are more the retailer control. Number two, they're immediate. I can ask, I, I can have a question today and get the answer literally by the end of the day. I don't have to wait for some infrastructure to be deployed and spent and all that. Is that, is that what some, one of the biggest advantages to you guys as platforms? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, and, and we are in the image recognition space. So we have programs across the globe where we're deploying fixed cameras. Um, mm. We are putting them on robots where we have partnerships with folks who provide the robots. But that is a, a much longer burn. Um, and quite candidly, it's, there's, there's a pretty big capital outlay to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to Henry's point, I think it will continue to improve. And like most technologies, it will get less and less costly um, to do so. Um, but in the meantime, you're still going to have this need. And, and to Henry's point, I think our types of platforms fill that niche and fill that need pretty quickly. Got it. So let's transition to that question. It's, it's, a, it's a question that I've gotten before. Um, so there's a data capture component, which I'm assuming is a cell phone, an iPad, or something to collect this in, information. And then there's turning that particular picture into something that's actionable quickly. Can you set product recognition? That's been the age old nemesis. If I could just go up and take a picture and it can tell me all the things that were wrong, rather than having to take it back and analyze, et cetera. What, what do you think that, where, where are we in product recognition today? And, and where do you think the future looks like? We have come an incredibly long way. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting as Trax was recruiting me, I knew exactly who Trax was. I knew they were an image recognition company, um, you know, for, for several years. Um, but it, it really has come a long way and it continues to improve with AI and, and things of that nature as, as you go forward. The simplest way to, to, to think about image recognition as it stands today with consumer products is if the human eye can recognize the difference between two products simply by looking at them, image recognition will work to do all sorts of things and glean all sorts of insight. However, it's when you get into smaller SKUs or things that look incredibly alike um, color cosmetics, uh, a great example, things that are side faced, uh, very hard for image recognition to be able to understand. Um, but again, it, it's getting better and it evolves literally on a, on a monthly basis. It, uh, and let me let me stop yeah. you there. Is, is it because of the fact that the product is so small and you're not getting a quality image or is it literally hard to even if you're at a really high quality image to be able to tell the two together? Which which yeah. is it? It's the latter. It's really, okay. it, even though it's small, it's still hard to get an image that clarifies the difference between the two. And yeah. what's interesting is some things that I would thought we'd, we'd have a tough time with, like gift cards, for example. We can recognize gift cards, but when you get into side-faced uh, lipsticks or nail polishes or things like that, that's where it gets really, really challenging to do. Got it. Got it. So, so it's in much better shape than it was before. It's at a better platform, but I'm, I'm sensing based on your comments, there's still a lot of opportunity in the, in the image recognition space. There is, and I, and I think there are a handful of manufacturers, some of our largest clients that have really gone all in and adopted it, whether it's like I mentioned before, the perfect store type programs um, or things of that nature that, that have really seen the benefit um, or they use it for um, better understanding category compliance, planogram integrity, and they use it as an opportunity to go and position with their buyers to get better, uh, a more advantageous shelf position um, in the next line review. So um, as more and more of those companies adopt, I think more and more will will see the benefit. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to steal the thunder for the next podcast. We'll talk about that at the end. But I think product recognition is one of those things that has come a long way. And there's still a lot of opportunity. And, and that's part of this is, do I need to know that that particular label is not that product? 
or do I need to know it's that label and I can tell you what product it is, right? So that, there's a there's a big distinction. Am I looking for, sure. I can tell you it is the correct product or it's something else. I can't tell you what it is, but I know it's wrong. It's a plug, it's a spread, something else like that. For Henry, sure. your thoughts on this space? Yeah, I mean, it, there's there you're you're hitting on some of those nuances, and and my buddy Sarjun, uh, uh, you know, I, I that I meet with from time to time, uh -huh. um, you know, we talk about all these different dynamics as we're trying to look at uh, technology, his technology and our capabilities coming together to provide mm -hmm. some different uh, distinctives for for the market. But Got it. you know, one of the things that we're starting to uh, see across the world, and I, 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 I see from different solutions uh, in Europe as well here in the U.S., is that people are starting to, to think about maybe we don't need to be perfect in this space, and maybe it's just good enough to give us perspective. So if, you're, if your objective is to get to perfect view of a shelf, Ken mentioned a lot of those nuances where it just makes it nearly impossible, right, mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to, to come up with accurate information. But if, man, if you, you can use a solution and you can get directional perspective on a variety of issues, um, you know, OSA being one of them, right? Yep. Um, and then I think the integration of, of that technology with our capabilities start to make more sense. And I think we're going to get more practical as we go forward. Um, and both, both the providers and the solution providers and the clients have to come together and, and say, what problems are we really wanting to see? Now, we talk about, Ken, Ken mentioned this, they want, people want to know share or shelf, you know, but you don't want to know share or shelf every day. Right. You, know? you need to know that periodically, but a lot of people have this thing in their mind that, hey, I want, to, I want to use this fancy technology to tell me my share of shelf to the nth degree. Um, and you spend a lot of money doing that, a lot of time chasing that. Um, uh, so I, I think there is a practical application that's coming uh, as well as the technology continuing to improve. I think that will create adoption uh, in, in, in more wide variety of, of categories and retailers. Awesome, awesome. All right, we're going to turn it over to uh, audience. I'm going to ask uh, Mike Price, why don't you go ahead and unmute your uh, phone uh, in your video if you'd like, and go ahead and ask your question. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, Ken. Good to reconnect. It's been a while. Um, Henry, you, you made some brilliant points about, I guess, the, I guess the scope that you can measure with the crowd in one day or, or you know, in, 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 in one particular situation. I guess the challenge I have, and I saw this in my long career at uh, Unilever, is working with all the different technologies, with POS data and algorithms, uh, with some stuff with cameras. I was a big advocate of um, uh, crowd um, and also of image recognition. But I think the challenge I have, to, I guess, to both of you is how do you sort of bring it all together to really sort of understand that true cause and effect? Because I've also followed the series. And I think it's been brilliant, but I've sort of sat here slightly with a sort of, uh, you know, I guess a slight frustration thinking, how do you actually build an ecosystem to really understand that sort of cause and effect? Because you can go out and measure, as we did across the US, and unfortunately it was with one of your competitors, you know, Saturday afternoon, ice cream category, you know, really low availability. So the question comes back, okay, so, so we know we've got a problem or a burning platform, well, they did have, um, but it's the why. Then how do you get into that? Then you start looking at the POS data, and that tells you something possibly slightly different. And then you've got the image recognition piece to look at the, you know, the share of shelf and the, the realogram versus the planogram. So it's how do you actually bring all these fantastic components together to, to you know, to really, to, I guess, take it to the next level. That's my question. Yeah, my, Mike, I think it's a, I think it's a terrific question. Um, it's interesting because we we are the company that is providing the the audit data or the image recognition data, and there's a certain set of analysis that comes with that that is 
standard um, that we do, but we only have access to what our data shows us, right? Whether it's the image recognition data or the, the causal data that actually comes from the rep being out in the stores. Um, it really heavily depends on our client. We have some clients that are highly sophisticated and they only want, they only want what we can give them, right? These are gonna be larger CPGs, um, obviously like the one that you went to. Um, and, and, and then you have medium type of companies that are gonna want us to, you know, maybe they'll share their data with us, their point of sale data, and, and then we'll do some analysis or smaller companies who, who frankly just don't have a grasp on how, how that all comes together. So it really all depends that the challenge for us is it, it, it's not gonna make, first off, we're not gonna get access to retail link data because we're not a supplier. Um, you know, we could go and purchase Nielsen or IRI data uh, and POS data, but there's gotta be a cost analysis there to see if that, that actually makes sense. So it really depends on, on, at least in our world, on who we're, who we're working with and to what level they, they have the extent. We have the analysts that can go very deep if we have the data to look at it, but some of them frankly just wanna do it on their own. Yeah, Mike, uh, again, brilliant question. Um, you know, I, I would throw in a, a, a uh, equally important uh, partner in the solution set is that uh, we've got to figure out how to um, bring the retailers into this uh, equation. Um, you know, because the, our clients, the the CPG companies, et cetera, um, you know, they they want this problem fixed, um, uh, but a lot of times there are just um, issues at the retailer in, in getting those, uh, those solutions implemented uh, and, and having uh, you know, the retailer with their labor shortages and, and whatnot be able to react to the data. Um, but um, it is, it, it has got to be a collaborative solution. I think we're gonna have to create incentives in the industry uh, for, uh, for labor. Uh, to go in and fix that and for um, for those solutions to be implemented and adopted by retailers. Um, you know, um, this this is a this is a age old problem. Mike and I have talked this before. Um, you know, on shelf availability has been around my whole career, 40 years. Um, and um, we have brought more technology, we have brought more labor, um, and we have brought our services to the, to the marketplace. We have a better understanding and better analysis on the issues uh, at hand, uh, but uh, the, the problem still persists. So uh, we are gonna need as an industry come together uh, and, and figure out ways to collaborate to really fix this. I don't think a uh, field agent or tracks or Acosta, you name them, uh, we're gonna fix that problem. It's a collaborative effort. Yeah. It is uh, according to IHL, a trillion dollar opportunity, if you believe that. Um, and on-shelf availability is one of those things that if you ask a retailer, what is your on-shelf availability? They probably couldn't tell you, right? They could tell you in stock, which is basically how many do I have versus how many I think I'll sell, but how many are actually available on the shelf or on the display for a customer becomes a much tougher thing. And that's why we've been talking about kind of some of this thing. Ken, you actually showed, uh, and I would like to put that uh, example up on the screen. You sent me an actual case study where there was a real issue, you guys worked with the, the CPG company. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up there, but why don't you walk us through that? Cause I think that's a real practical example of how you could potentially use these services for this kind of work. Sure, absolutely. If you wanna, wanna go ahead and bring that up. So yep. um, this is a, a, a very typical use case that we, um, we tend to get from our clients around OSA. And this happened to be um, uh, to the point that I just uh, was, was telling Mike about, Mike Price about. Um, this is this is a customer who's got um, a very deep analytical bench. Um, so in this case, a leading HBC manufacturer noticed a, a sharp sales decline for a line of uh, deodorant and antiperspirant target stores, uh, and they ruled out distribution issues or supply chain issues. They have a stated goal for this category of 96% OSA. That's very high. 
Um, and they have a metric for every 1% that the product is below 96% OSA. So the audit scope itself was very simple. 1,857 target stores that, that audited over a one-week period, um, 11 SKUs audited, and we were able to show them in that time period that five SKUs were under 96%, some as low as 48, 48%, some as high as you know 75 But the company was then able to utilize that data and take it to their merchant um, at Target and work to get orders pushed out. And, and I think that brings up another point and, and one thing that we really strive to do um, as business development people in selling any program that we have. But you know, just because a, a client comes to us with an OSA audit opportunity, that, that's great and we want to execute it. But we're always asking them, okay, what are you really trying to solve? What, what does success look like here? What is the end in mind? Because at the end of the day, we want to be able to show stories like this, where they were able to go back and there's a tangible result, um, a, a quantifiable result that they were able to, to come up with. So um, uh, trying to start with the end in mind around all of these audits is really important for us. Mm, great example. Great example. Hey, uh, let me switch gears to some of the things that I hear from other people regarding store audits, just in true, full transparency. These are things people go, yeah, but you always hear a yeah, but at the end of it. Uh, and I'll just throw these out there and just kind of random and you guys can respond to them. Um, the first one is, yeah, that's all really good, but it's way too expensive and there's no ROI. Well, this is a pretty good example, Ken, where well, that's not the case, but react to the it's too expensive and there's no ROI uh, comment. Yeah, you know, I, I would just go back to what I just said. You know, we try and start these with the end in mind, and and candidly, we've turned down some of these if 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 the client doesn't have a clear understanding of what the potential ROI is. And obviously, we give them examples about a, how to measure that, et cetera. And 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 truly and honestly, mostly today, people that are looking to secure or procure these kind of services rather um, have an OS uh, ha have an ROI in mind. With, with what they're trying to accomplish. So, um, you know, th that's what I would, that's what I would have. We're always trying to do a program that has some sort of a return on investment, whether it's a return on investment of sales or cost, or in the case of a retailer, uh, increased productivity, et cetera. Gotcha. Henry, any bills on that? Yeah. It, it, in terms of, um, I, I've seen, Two different types of program. The majority of our programs are very similar to to Ken's uh, Ken's outline here, uh, but there are, you know, more sophisticated players uh, that are are needing to have a pulse. They have enough business uh, in in these major retailers uh, to want to have a pulse of what's going on in the stores because those are the triggers in which their supply chain, their operations teams can co go to work. They can't afford not to know that five SKUs are less than 96%. And the, with the dynamic nature of retail, uh, we have programs that we're tracking all year long for, for teams um, and looking across, you know, 15 retailers. Um, and so there are some tracking and, and um, directional uh, data that uh, some of the bigger guys are, are using uh, to, to drive the business. They can't afford to be out of stock or uh, be uh, in a place where uh, their competitor is, is, is in stock and they're not in stock. So mm. there, there's a competitive activity side of this uh, that's just as important than uh, knowing you. Go back to the uh, time of uh, the pandemic when it was free for all. Shelves were just, you know, uh, bare. And uh, retailers were looking at, uh, you know, we had retailers wanting to know who has inventory. Yeah. And am I getting <laughs> short? Right. Yeah. Uh, so those are different dynamics that, uh, again, when an audit or uh, uh, subtracting helps decision makers uh, take action that have big ramifications for their categories in their business. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Great perspective by both of you. A um, couple other questions I've heard from people. Um, will the retailer allow me to take pictures in the store? Although I think that concern has been really minimized over the years. But I remember every time we brought a camera out, 
you, you get a you're not allowed to take pictures in here kind of thing. And the second one is any concerns from a privacy perspective of your folks in stores taking pictures that they potentially could capture privacy information of shoppers in the aisles or anything like that. Any any feedback on either one of those two? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a shot at that. Uh, you're right. I mean, the um, it used to be that it was, uh, you know, if, if you're taking out a camera, the retailers were suspect or or wouldn't allow it. Um, from a process perspective, um, we follow a process of always introducing ourselves, advising the manager on duty of what we're there to do. And, and uh, honestly, more than 99 percent of the time now, it includes a photo, whether we're doing a reset or an audit or something We're we're definitely collecting a photo. As far as the privacy issues, um, I know in our image recognition uh, technology, um, the system automatically removes if, 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 if there was inadvertently a photo taken of a customer, it will automatically remove that. Um, I can't speak to 100% of it, but I know we have some guardrails in place around privacy. And then of course, there's contracts with the, the individual clients as well, that will stipulate um, what we can and cannot share. Gotcha. Henry, how about you? Yeah, we, you know, we're, we're proud at Field Agent that we created the space of going in and sending shoppers in uh, back in 2010, that, that that was not a thing. And that was, that was the overriding issue uh, that people were asking. Today, everybody wants you to use your smartphone in store. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it really doesn't make sense uh, for retailers, uh, in-store personnel to accost any shopper <laughs> using a, a smartphone. In fact, you know, that doesn't make sense. So that, that issue is gone. Um, you know, uh, with the smartphone, uh, people are taking uh, pictures of product and sending it to their husband or wife or kids and say, what do you think of this item? It's just a normal way of, of living. So that issue is gone. Uh, in terms of privacy, uh, we have very strict policies um, in terms of, you know, all of all of the uh, pictures that we would get. Uh, we don't we don't we don't have an issue with that. Uh, that's a very, very important issue, uh, but not an issue for us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to open it up for questions from uh, any audience members, but I would like to get you guys to give us very, very incredibly helpful understanding of what does sales audits look like? What's the business drivers for them? What exactly can we do with them? I, I guess my big question for, for both of you, just to think about it individually, what's the future look like? I mean, given where we are today, you started in 2010, it's now 2022. We expect you'll be around for 10 more years, 20 more years, whatever it looks like. I don't know what it was going to look like, but what's the future look like? Uh, Henry, we'll start with you. What does the future look like from your perspective? You know, I, I think I think there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, a lot of change from the technology standpoint. The stores are getting digitized, you know. Uh, uh, the Walmarts of the world uh, are, are digitizing the store every which way they can. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think your, your next uh, episode uh, with these image recognition folks, um, that's going to become more and more important. Those technologies, they're going to be integrated. Uh, they still need sources of input and, and they're going to have to address the capital. But I think if I had a vision for the industry is I would love for suppliers and retailers to develop win-win solutions for having product on the shelf mm -hmm. versus the carrot versus the stick, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. actually worked with a supplier who was leading uh, or bringing a breakthrough concept of saying, you know, let's agree to a, to a, a level, uh, an OSA level that's beneficial for both of our products and your category. Mm. And uh, if we can hit that, we want to offer you financial rewards for executing that. Mm. And if you don't get that, then there is no financial reward. So it's less about I'm going to penalize, but hey, there's more because the ROI for my business is better when we have product on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And I think that level of collaboration or partnership 
which still requires you to be able to prove that your level is X, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's going to have to change the way the scorecards are measured and the way the people are going to incentivize the, the retailers uh, to, to play their role. Um, and if we can get to that, I think we can change the game. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to do the same things uh, over and over again. We may have better knowledge of what's going on, but we have to change the game mm. in order to change the results. So that's the future. Yeah. So I didn't hear a lot about other than product recognition. I didn't hear a lot about technology investments is really more. How do you measure it and how do you use it to drive OSA? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's good. Ken, how about yourself? Yeah, I would tend to agree with, with, with what Henry was saying as well. The, the only thing that I would say is I believe, obviously, and I've said this already today, the image recognition is going to continue to get better. Yep. I also believe that you're going to start seeing U.S. retailers and retailers in general start adopting what some of the retailers are doing in Europe, where they are utilizing in other parts of the globe as well, where they are utilizing image recognition, whether it's a fixed camera or it's on a robot to not only make themselves more efficient um, in, with their labor in terms of what they're doing in the stores, but I also believe that you will see somebody come together and collaborate and ultimately turn that insight, maybe initially only in a handful of categories, but into another stream of data that can be purchased by CPG companies, much mm. like Nielsen is today or IRI is today. Mm. Uh, because it is truly, uh, when, you, when you affix a camera, and that camera is taking a photo every five minutes. It's truly giving you a real picture. Um, I think Mike Price used the, the word realogram. Um, it, it really does give you a real idea of what's going on at the shelf. And uh, we all know the retailers aren't going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a data set that I believe will be shared. Uh, the cost will be shared with retail or with yeah. the CPGs. Uh, great perspective. Great perspective. Well, you prompted a question from Mike Price. Thank you very much, because his hand went up. No, his hand actually went up before you you said his name, Ken. But uh, Mike, go ahead and unmute and ask your question for us. So I, I really feel like I'm giving the guys a hard time, and I'm not meant to. It's really about <laughs> it's it's really about the future building. I think on what you you both alluded to, and I guess if it, it might exist, I think I'm reasonably well connected, and I've and I've been in execution for 25 years, but. One of the challenges is if you want, if, if today, if you're in a major CPG and you wanted to do an audit, shall we say, at key trading time on a Saturday afternoon across the globe in a number of key markets for key SKUs in that market, how could you do it? Because I had that, I got given that challenge when I was in my former life. And you know what? I couldn't do it. We managed to do the US. We managed to do Europe, working with a partner there. Uh, but we struggled in Latin America. I struggled to get stuff or bits from Asia. Is there a crowd association or network? Because I appreciate you might be, um, Henry, I know you're very strong in the US. Uh, and Ken, I know, I think you've got operations in a couple of other markets uh, outside of the US. But, you know, if you're in a, a, a top tier CPG or a CPG with global coverage and you want to look at something like that, when I got given that challenge, I said to the business, I just can't do this. Now, in the markets, we could do it in. The briefing went out on a Thursday, and we did the audits on Saturday afternoon, and, and we blew people away, partly with the speed uh, and the accuracy, and it, it created some real eye-opening moments of just how bad or what some of the opportunities were. But it's around the scope, I guess, is the future, what I'm really asking the question about. When do we get to global crowdsourcing in a controlled way without – you know, loads of different apps with, you know, partners that we've never heard of. And it's, you know, it's all so fragmented. Sorry, tough question. I know. So I can see from the other place is, thinking, uh, get this guy off the line. My God. No, no, no. That, that, like, I think, I think Ken's got a solution. So go, Ken. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, well, if, well, if I did, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to, you know, be working every day, but, um, you know, I, I would love to see something like that. Unfortunately, I think it's it's still a ways off. There are, you're right, Mike, there are in-market um, solutions that are out there, but uh, no one has yet, you know, pulled together uh, a coalition, if you will, of global crowdsource auditing companies that can do that. I think it's a, I think it's a terrific idea, um, you know, 
in th in theory on paper i think once you start getting into the specifics of country by country specific details i think i, I certainly think somebody could probably set up a platform that would work globally uh, from a from a reporting perspective but it's the nuance of how do you organize all of that and get all of those get all of those companies to operate together um Henry, I don't know what else you'd add to that. I I, I don't, sir, have that solution <laughs> today. It, it's a loose network, Mike, as you know. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, collaborative partners. Um, but, you know, covering the world uh, is, a, is a challenge. There's some geopolitical reasons. And there's just a lot of, lot of uh, things uh, outside of our control. Um, and, um, you know, I think... I think it's like anything else that uh, that that you got to develop is is there a big enough addressable market for this? Um, and I would tell you today there isn't. There's a need, but there isn't a big enough addressable market. So it'll be hard for entrepreneurs uh, to to want to go and make that happen. But we we do try to provide that from time to time. I have I have people that we can contact for for China uh, in Europe. Uh, we are we operate in seven countries outside of the U.S., uh, but I can tell you any uh, multi-country project is a major uh, complexity for us to execute. Got it. We got a couple of questions from George. I'm going to go ahead and try and summarize what I'm seeing from him, which is I think building on exactly what you guys have just talked about. Can you talk about the duplication of effort? We've got shelf data being collected by retailers by brokers by data companies by you guys as service is there is there any discussion in, in, in the near future to streamline any of that or you just see this continuing to grow independently i have a i have a very personal opinion of that um, just based on my my history in the business i've worked for several of the large brokers today um, and i believe that the national brokers and sales agencies are incredibly talented uh, at the headquarters selling piece, um, the category management piece, the analytics piece. I think they're very, very good at that. Um, in all transparency, they've been executing at retail the same way for decades. Mm. Um, I think the crowd model of being flexible, pinpointed, um, and uh, have the scale and the speed to be able to react is truly going to make a difference um, going yep. forward. And um, candidly, I believe that that's what we bring to the table. It really is a different way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe uh, as effective, if not more effective. So do you two guys feel like you're completing work with these service providers, these brokers, or do you feel to a certain degree you're competing against them? You know, I, 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 can, I remember the days when Ken was on the, on the broker side and mm -hmm. You know, uh, and now he's on this side, um, and you know there is there's there is competition, um, mm -hmm. and you felt that uh, we were exploring uh, across all the major brokers to how do we partner, and uh, I think when push comes to shove, uh, at the board levels, at the senior management levels, uh, th that's where it breaks down. I think mm -hmm. at the operating levels. You know, it only makes sense when a broker says, I can't cover these stores to look to someone who can. Uh, and it used to be about, hey, how can we complement and supplement what you're doing? Um, and for a variety of reasons, that just doesn't happen. Uh, maybe, Ken, you have, again, you, you've you been on both sides. Maybe you have a special point of view on that. Uh, I We haven't been able to break through that. Yeah, the, the irony to the conversation, um, Mike, is is all of the major brokers and at least seven or eight service providers that are national today are clients of Trax. Hmm. And it's exactly what Henry was talking about. We augment their teams. We offset where they've got open territory coverage. The crowd model, um, the gig worker, um, while it has its negative connotations to many, is truly amazing in the sense that it does fill gaps where um, traditional agencies have had a tough time um, or can't fill up enough of a territory to, to staff a, a full-time territory. Um, it, it's also just a, a difference in the mentality of a, of, a, of a crowd worker. A crowd worker tends to be much more technologically savvy. They're much more entrepreneurial. 
I tell the story all the time. Every time I get in an Uber, I'll ask the driver, what is this the only thing they do? And 95% of the time they're telling me, no, 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 I'm, I work two other jobs or I'm trying to, I, my wife bought a pool and I'm trying to pay that off or I've got <laughs> student debt that I've got to pay down or medical debt, whatever, whatever it might be. These are hungry people. And we really mm. saw it kind of rear its head in the, uh, you know, largely in the, in the pandemic for sure. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Um, Henry, any closing comments? Anything I should have asked you that I didn't? No, I, I, I just want to make one point is that um, I think uh, the early distinctive that I made was, hey, how do you serve people uh, that may not be, uh, you know, some of the small, medium-sized folks? Uh, how do you get them on a product that gives them visibility to what's going on? We've been moving into that space, developing products that can be self-serve, uh, that provide the same quality and mm -hmm. speed and coverage that uh, you know large clients of ours uh, get to enjoy. Uh, so, democratizing this capability is one of the one of the strategies and goals that we have in providing for that. And uh, so, yeah, our, our Plum Marketplace is one of those uh, things that we've done uh, to make it easy. Um, to get this type of capability without uh, without being a big guy. You awesome. Know? We all want to chase those uh, and we want those clients, but uh, we've democratized that for, for many of the other players in the market. Perfect. Ken, any closing comments from you? Yeah, I would, ju I would just say that, you know, I've been doing this for a while and, and I've not seen uh, as much change as I've seen in the last probably 36 months. Obviously, mm -hmm. the pandemic drove a lot of that, um, but I'm seeing things that I never thought I would see before um, in the way things are going. I'm seeing incredible technologies emerge and in, in people that are very creative in the way that they're trying to solve problems. And um, I would just like to thank Henry and, and Matt and Mike for uh, allowing me the opportunity to talk and be help happy to um, have further conversations offline. Uh, Mike, I think you've got my uh, contact information and Henry's there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And these QR codes will, will definitely get you to both the field agent and the tracks folks. So guys, thank you very, very much for your participation. I uh, really do appreciate it. I do definitely appreciate both the U of A and conversations on retail for hosting it. Uh, just a couple of shameless plugs for some a couple of things that are coming up, up right. Uh, we actually have another podcast next week. Uh, it's all about RFID. We have Deanna Baker, who's the retired senior vice president and GMM of Walmart, who basically led the RFID initiative at Walmart and pushed that all the way to the top of Walmart. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about, you know, why she did that, what the driving factor was and, and what, what she wanted to try and accomplish. Andy Murray, who's the ex um, CMO for ASDA, and he was a, a, a C level leader at Walmart and Procter and Gamble. Uh, Bill Hargrave is the president of U University of Memphis and Justin Patton. We're all going to talk about we got to know what we have and where it's located, which is primarily an RFID platform and not so much in the some of the categories that Ken and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Henry were just talking about. But that, those are going to be important discussions as well. So QR code is there. Please register if you're interested in being to, to that. And I think I think Ken, you already mentioned it, or or, or Henry, or both of you. Uh, we do have a the next session uh, around this platform, which is October 21st. Uh, it will be on product recognition, and we will have Boston Nova, Infolect, and Sam Snap to Insight. I'm still working on confirming one of them, but uh, I think we will be able to do that. I'm definitely excited about what that product recognition roadmap looks like. And, and how we can get away from, um, you know, that problem that Ken, you just laid out, which is like a two items that are real close to each other. How do I recognize one versus the other? I think that is will continue has and can will continue to be some of the focus areas of, of this. So thank you very much. Uh, we will have this podcast uh, shared out via LinkedIn and YouTube and the audio channel here in a few weeks. So if you had a chance to join us live, you get an early release of that. But for the rest of you, uh, we'll uh, we'll share it out via LinkedIn. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great Friday. Have a good weekend.